right, we're going to get started now. This panel, this panel discussion will, is on industrial interdependence and war. And uh, I am going to uh, join this panel as a moderator. Um, our, our colleague, who we hope to have here, unfortunately, is quite sick. So let's all give, send him happy thoughts. Hope he'll get better. Um, so this panel is a, is a very interesting panel. I want to introduce the panelists, but also introduce the concept, which is Anne Marie Slaughter said at the beginning of this. She she talked about the Thomas Friedman quote, and I, I think um, Clyde Prestowitz brought it up again about how countries in the same supply chain do not go to war. That we have a presumption that interdependence brings security or stability, at any rate. Um, and while that may be true um, in many respects, it also has a downside, which is you, you rise together, you fall together. So the question that we want to address in this panel is that what if there is conflict? What if, you know, and, there, and in some ways there already is low intensity conflict in cyberspace and in other places, but what if the South China Sea situation gets worse? What if it does go beyond friction into something more kinetic? or at least more overt. Um, what happens to the U.S. economy and to U.S. supply chains and, and to the point, uh, those of our allies and partners? And uh, certainly one of the things that I'm personally very interested in is that we've, I've looked in my program a great deal at raw resources, at natural resources. So for critical minerals, you know, for uh, every one of you out there who has a smartphone, you have a periodic table in your hands. And a lot of those elements and those critical minerals in your device, de facto, there wasn't much trade for them 20 years ago. It's a, it's a new global market and not a very transparent one, but one thing I can tell you is that China dominates it, certainly in certain elements, uh, most publicly known as in raw, uh, rare earth elements. So what does this mean if we get into a state of, of advanced friction or even conflict that we have some concentrated interdependencies like that in our system. And to have that discussion, let me just transition over to this part of the, of the world here. To have that discussion, we couldn't ask for uh, a better lead speaker than New America's own Barry Lynn. And uh, I'm actually gonna read your, your bio, but I do know it um, by heart since we, I have the great pleasure of working with Barry. He's a senior fellow here at New America, and he's the director of the Open Markets Program, uh, the founding director, it's his brainchild. He's also the author of Cornered, The New Monopoly Capitalism and the Economics of Destruction, and End of the Line, The Rise and Coming Fall of the Global Corporation. Previously, he was the executive editor of Global Business Magazine, and he worked as a correspondent in Peru, Venezuela, and the Caribbean. Next to him, we have Christopher Gopal, who's an expert in global supply chain strategies and operations management. He is the co-author of three books, including Supercharging Supply Chains, and was a former senior operations executive at several leading global companies and consultancies. So not only a, a, an intellectual and an academic thinker, but also a practitioner who's been in the business world and can comment from that point of view. And then we're very fortunate also to have with us Shane Harris, who has been a fellow at New America, but uh, his day job it right now is as a senior correspondent at the Daily Beast, where he writes on national security, intelligence, and cybersecurity. He's the author of At War, The Rise of the Military Internet Complex, which is a terrific book, um, and The Watchers. Previously, he worked at Foreign Policy and The Washingtonian, covering national security. So what I'd like to do, um, I, I do want to get the three of you in a conversation, um, but I also want to give you a chance to make an opening comment about your view on this and about um, the topic of this panel and the sort of industrial concentration and what that means. And let's give Barry a chance to lead off and, and since uh, his vision has really animated a lot of this event today. So Barry, if you would, give us, give us an overview of, of why this is an issue of concern um, and what it means right now at this time. Well, thanks, Sharon. And um, I guess what I'm gonna do is start with a story and this is back going to uh, 1999. And there was this event on September 21st was that there was an earthquake in Taiwan. And it was a pretty large earthquake. It was 7.5 uh, you know, magnitude. It killed 2,500 people. But it was in Taiwan. It was in, on the other side of the, the sea. 
from the United States. What was different about that event was that within a few days of that event, all these factories in the United States shut down in California and in, 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 in Texas. What happened was that the earthquake had broken the supply of energy to the airport. And because they couldn't fly airplanes out of Taiwan, they couldn't actually fly these, these chips, these semiconductors, from Xinjiang, south of Taipei, to, to, to the United States. That supply chain was so tight, it was a just-in-time supply chain, that that break led very quickly to the shutdown of these factories on the other side of the sea. So the, the, it was a proof that the system, the, the industrial system of the world, essentially, was immensely tightly integrated. Within a few days, earthquake on one side of the, 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 the world leads to a shutdown of factories on the other side of the world. So this was essentially proof that we had seen in the previous couple of years, few years, a revolution in the structure of, the, of, in, of industrial organization. You know, up until that point, through almost all of history, certainly through the 20th century, in industry had been doubly compartmentalized. You had these vertically integrated uh, corporations uh, within vertically integrated nation states. So if, you know, in terms of like the alternators in a car, you would have had 20, 30 companies making those alternators. But here was proof that in at least one case, all of something really important was being made in one place in the world. So that was a structural revolution. So that event was a huge challenge to policymakers. Because basically th this event proved that the system, for one thing, was extremely fragile. An event, a localized event on the other side of the world could create a disruption that spreads all around the world. This, you, what, what that was, to really understand that event, it was the first industrial crash. You know, we, we know about financial crashes. This was an industrial crash. You lose, you know, financial crashes, you lose access to a source of, of credit, of debt. With, a, with an industrial crash, you lose source to a, a certain type of supply, and then a system uh, suddenly collapses. The other thing that we learned from that event was that because everything was in one place, something really important was in place, there was a whole different structure of power in the world than we were used to thinking about. Up to that point, Power was, you know, no one could hold up, no nation could hold up another nation because they had something industrial that the other country needed. In the cases of certain kinds of material products, you know, rare earths, there could be holdups, but not in the case of industrial products. But now you saw an entirely different structure of power. You saw these kind of new shackles uh, on, on nations. So that happened in 1999. Over the next couple of years, over the next few years, but you know, by say 2005, a whole bunch of books started coming out about, hey, we got this whole new reality. And you know, the, Tom Friedman's book has been mentioned a couple times, The World is Flat. Uh, there was this other book called, by this guy named Thomas P.M. Barnett. It was called The Pentagon's New Map. It was about this new structure of power that, this, you know, had cr that was created by this new structure of industry. There was a, a really good book by this guy named Yossi Sheffi. He's an MIT uh, supply chain guru. It was called Resilient Enterprise. There was my own book. Each of us attempted to describe this revolution in industry and, sort of ex and then sort of describe what the implications were. You know, how this would affect the way nations interact, how this would affect the way that companies uh, think, companies operate, how this would affect the way that executives think. You know, as has been mentioned repeatedly, Tom Friedman's view of the world that was in the world as flat was essentially utopian in nature, you know. It was, it described a mechanism, you know, the supply chain system, you know. He basically said this crash that had happened in 1999, this earthquake, that proved that nations would never go to war with each other. That was proof. It was, it was, a, it was a mechanical system that would lead to that would de deliver us to the promised land. It was peace and prosperity forevermore. And you know, it's worth going through this quote again. He said, no two countries that are part of the same, of a major global supply chain will ever fight a war against each other. Now my work, and actually the work of people like Clyde Prestowitz in the previous panel, we said that is not true. You know, we were rather, you know, we were the realists in the room and we said we have to look at this in an entirely different way because what we see are these entirely new forms of risk. We said the system was very dangerous. 
you know, there were a few people in government that paid attention to us at the time. There was the people in the Snow uh, Treasury Department and Secretary Snow's Treasury Department. They actually asked a few questions about this. But for the most part, what we saw was that the, the administration then and the, the subsequent administration, the Obama administration, had basically entirely ignored these new realities, this revolution in structure. They've entirely ignored this. which means that to the extent that there was a policy decision that was made by the U.S. government over the last 10 years about how to respond to these, this new structure of industry, it was basically they went with Tom Friedman. They went with the utopian answer. And this is despite the fact that over the last number of years, we've actually seen numerous other events that showed how fragile this system is. There was the Lehman crash, the Lehman financial crash, the big financial stock market crash of 2008. There was the Icelandic volcano explosion in 2010. There were the Thai floods in 2011. There was a Tohoku uh, earthquake in, in Japan uh, the, with the big tsunami back in 2011. All of these events resulted in large, cascading, cross-border disruptions that triggered a, a loss of access, that were triggered by a loss of access to some concentrated source of supply. People did notice what was happening. You know, after the Lehman crash, a group of WTO economists, they wrote a report on this, and they said that global production networks, supply chains, have an inherent magnification effect on shocks. After the Tohoku event, the tsunami, the Federal Reserve of the United States reported the biggest three-month collapse in manufacturing ever because of an earthquake in Japan. Biggest ever drop in manufacturing activity in the United States, bigger than after the crash of 2008. The Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry in Japan, actually I think there, I don't know if something got, uh, there was a paper passed out? Did you guys get a, uh, well anyway, the, the, the Ministry of Economy, uh, uh, METI in Japan, they put out a paper in 2012 that said that that earthquake had revealed that the supply chain in the manufacturing industry has a diamond structure in which parts and material at the tier two or deeper level are concentrated in a certain supplier and that this is incredibly dangerous. Today we see also, just to sort of prove that we have a, a problem that we have never really dealt with before, to prove that basically the Tom Friedman view of the world is not accurate and it does not depict what is actually taking place in the world, we see China challenging the United States, as the, the previous panel made very clear, in the South China Sea, challenging our treaty ally Japan in the East China Sea. So this is proof positive that Tom Friedman's thesis was grossly wrong. And it is also proof positive that the U.S., the attitude, the policies of the U.S. government these last number of years, because they were essentially Tom, they followed the Tom Friedman recipe, were gr are grossly dangerous and grossly wrong. So what, what can we conclude? You know, the panel question, you know, that we're starting with is what would happen if there is conflict in the South China Sea or the East China Sea, even a relatively minor conflict that might disrupt, result in a temporary disruption in trade flows? Maybe it's not even a hot conflict, but any kind of conflict that would result in the disruption of trade flows in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, what it would result in is one of two things either economic catastrophe, a cascading collapse that would make the 2008 breakdown in finance look like a minor event, or it would result in a political humiliation of the first magnitude, because someone would have to give. Now this is not something that TPP is going to fix. You know, so just to jump ahead, it's like there's really, we have two choices. You know, and our choices are either we have to move our warships and our warplanes off of the factory floor. 
because that's where they're sitting right now. They're sitting on the middle of the factory floor. You cannot, but we all know what happens is if you explode a bomb in the middle of a factory floor, whatever's made in that factory, you don't get it. The other option is that we can use the power of the state, the U.S. government, to force a restructuring of the production systems on which the American people depend. So. Okay. So, um, the, I want to just make clear that uh, since we're doing some Tom Friedman bashing here, that he was invited to speak today and was not available, and that we have an open invitation to him any time that he wants to engage in a debate and a discussion on these issues. So uh, he's welcome to defend himself. We would love it if he would. We think it's an important conversation to have. Now, having said that, Chris, those are some pretty provocative words Barry laid out. Uh, one of the things I'm curious is what you think of what he said, and more to the point, do businesses see this? Um, are they worried about it? And you're free to say whatever you want to say, but just a, just a to pose a question to you that I hope you'll address at some point. Uh, <coughs> but just to lay some context on this, I have no qualifications, as my esteemed panelists and colleagues do here, in policy. Uh, my experience is all about making things run, the global supply chain, and I've been at it for well, over 35 years. So it's a different context and a different perspective. Regarding your first question, is there anything to disagree with what Barry said? No, it's all fact. And it's all fact because supply chains today are incredibly fragile. We might not see that, but it's incredi they're incredibly fragile. And they're fragile for four reasons, essentially. First and foremost is what Barry described, the diamond structure. Anybody who's in the electronics industry, pharmaceuticals, military, knows this, that a few products are made and ultimately they boil down to a few component parts that are made by the same people, all of them. Your phones, your iPads, everything. It's called a diamond structure. There's, there's something new in the way uh, products have been managed. The second piece is most of these key components, the manufacturing product and the capabilities are concentrated today. They're concentrated in certain sections, in certain regions, in certain countries. They're not spread the way they used to be. For instance, all the chemicals that come into pharma products, a lot of them come from China. The pharma products generic themselves are starting to come from India. Electronics comes from Guangdong in China, elsewhere. LCDs, Korea and China. DRAMs, chips in China, Korea. There's a concentration of capacity. Everybody knows it. When you need these things, you go to the same people and you buy it from them for your products. The third point is that because of this, there are choke points in the distribution system. In other words, all the chips and electronics are coming through one thread from the Far East in China to LA or Long Beach or Seattle. And this is so prone to disruption, as all of you know, we had a major bankruptcy a few weeks ago. There are 5,000 containers sitting on the ocean somewhere, they can't go anywhere. It's people's products, and heaven only knows if there are military products in it, I don't know. Um, it's a problem. But the real issue I think Barry talked about is that everybody who makes these decisions to source, to buy, to build, are individuals governed by a different set of parameters. We're supply chain executives. We are governed by stock price. We are governed by lowest cost. And that too is not always true cost. It's lowest labor cost. We are governed by speed and liquidity, which means minimum inventory on the road, which means just in time, lean manufacturing, and so on. We are governed by commonality of parts, 
reduce costs, therefore a few um, suppliers, and fewer suppliers give us more leverage. Right. And nowadays, we are pushed by the market to look at things like corporate social responsibility, conflict minerals, international labor standards, but we don't embrace, we comply. I think these four issues are what's driving what Barry's talked about. And they're real. And there's no way they can be addressed unless the metrics that drive these companies are addressed. Thank you. We're, we're going to come back to you. <laughs> Let's oh, give right. Shane a chance. Sure. And, you know, from a, say whatever you want to say, but I think you're a very shrewd observer of national security and of all of these dynamics. I'd really like to hear your spin on it. Yeah, so, I mean, I come at this from the point of view of someone who's been reporting for what I would say is, you know, well, for a number of years on, uh, not necessarily a hot conflict, but a, a, a pretty heated one in terms of uh, the conflict between the U.S. and China in cyberspace. And why I, why I like this format for the discussion to talk about what I write about is because so much of, of this conflict is taking place in areas that very much affect trade interdependence and the supply chains. Um, so let me try and give you just a very sort of uh, absurdly condensed kind of you know, version of how the U.S.-China cyber conflict is playing out right now. And I think where it bears very much on the intellectual supply chain, if you like, which is to say that China has spent the better part of, I would say, the past 20 or so years in a very concerted and aggressive effort to steal U.S. intellectual property from manufacturers, particularly in the technology sector. But it's not unique to technology. I mean, if you go back to the mid-1990s, uh, there's case after case of industrial espionage aimed at uh, um, highly refined mach machine parts, uh, at software code, um, at the formula for what it is that makes the filling in Oreo cookies so white. That's a true story <laughs> that the FBI likes to tell. Um, a Chinese company tried to license that from Dow Chemical, and when they wouldn't do it, they stole it. Um, this escalated into the mid-2000s with a campaign of cyber espionage. So very much the kinds of industrial espionage that were occurring aimed at U.S. companies just sort of switched over from trying to do it in person to more doing it on the Internet because so many of the companies that had the intellectual property that the Chinese wanted uh, have not really done much of work to protect their computer systems, so this stuff was actually quite easy to steal. Um, <clears throat> this is not to say, by the way, that the United States doesn't engage in espionage against China. Of course it does. But the distinction that policymakers have always drawn and intelligence officials have always drawn is that we do not spy on other countries for the purposes of economic gain which is to say, for instance, we don't hack into the systems of Airbus and give information about their designs to Boeing so that Boeing will have a leg up in international competition for selling airplanes. But the Chinese have done this. And it was, it was, it was put to me in a uh, 2010 or 8 interview, I'm sorry, I think it was, by the director of national counterintelligence at the time, who really was one of the first people to, to draw attention to this issue publicly, um, the Chinese want to create a first world economy and they want to do it in a single generation and they'll do whatever it takes to do that. And he wasn't describing sort of a moralistic judgment to it, he was just saying these are the facts. So this really starts to change in probably the past, I would say, four or so years. In 2014, the United States indicted uh, five members of the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, which is sort of the nexus for a lot of this industrial espionage activity, um, and it charged them with hacking into U.S. companies and stealing intellectual property. Um, a lot of people at the time, including myself, sort of laughed at this and dismissed it and said, you know, naming and shaming people is great, but you're not going to fundamentally stop you know, this activity because the Chinese have a great incentive to do it. Um, they did not seem to be particularly concerned that people knew they were doing it, uh, the hacking that would go on at these companies was often described by people as very noisy, which is to say they didn't go to great lengths to try and obscure uh, any kind of Chinese sponsorship of it. Um, but I think we were a bit quick to, to dismiss uh, the power of actually indicting these individuals and on a national level as a matter of policy to start calling out China for this kind of activity and trying to condemn it, but also try to bring, uh, you know, you know to, to, to criminally charge it. Um, there's a line of thinking now that this resonated uh, within China and particularly within the PLA. Um, that the idea that we called out five officers in their military by name, included their photographs in an indictment, were able to say, we know you're doing it, we know where you're doing it, we know how you're doing it, 
really kind of shook them and, and perhaps demonstrated to them that we would actually push back against this activity because for a long time, I think what was stopping policymakers from aggressively trying to deter this kind of cyber espionage was China betting, and I think rightly so, that we didn't want to start a trade war with China. We didn't want to start sanctioning them over this activity because, as you know, my colleagues have talked about, we are interdependent with one another, and our trade alliance is so, is, our interdependencies are so strong. But that really did start to change, as I say. And in 2015, this remarkable thing happened where the White House decided, uh, after uh, much back and forth, that it was prepared to at least raise the threat of sanctioning China over this kind of activity. And there were some very sort of tense moments ahead of a visit in 2015 by Xi Jinping about whether we were going to announce sanctions for industrial espionage. And ultimately, um, I think it's fair to say the Chinese blinked. And we reached an agreement whereby, at least you know, in writing, uh, the Chinese have agreed not to conduct this kind of economic espionage that is spying on U.S. companies for the gain of other Chinese companies. Um, all the other spying is still, uh, is still okay to do, and we do it too. So that's kind of the condensed version of where we are right now. And I think it's important to understand that, that context because this really is one of the major points of conflict in cyberspace between the U.S. and China. Now, just briefly, when we talk about supply chains, literal supply chains in that context, um, there's a lot of concern within the intelligence community and the military over the security of supply chains, particularly for these products coming out of China, and whether or not they have been manipulated or embedded with surveillance uh, technology that is then put into our networks and our systems and essentially creates kind of a beachhead uh, for the Chinese government, the military. This is a, an issue that, frankly, the military was probably ahead of the curve on in terms of becoming very concerned about it and wanting to introduce what they call supply chain security as part of cybersecurity. Um, probably the most prominent example of where this plays out today uh, is in lawmakers and in law enforcement officials constantly raising concerns about whether or not Huawei, which is the major telecom firm uh, in China, is effectively a surveillance apparatus of the Chinese government. Uh, this flared up a little bit recently where Huawei has said it's interested perhaps in bidding on the construction of a new 5G data network in the United States, and that kind of set people at the FBI's head spinning. Um, so there's some people looking at that now. Um, and in just in terms of the actual supply chains themselves and how they can be disrupted through a cyber attack, uh, it's, it's not hard to imagine how that would work. I mean, you can attack critical infrastructure systems um, like electrical power plants. Um, you can attack factory machinery if it is in any way connected to industrial control systems which are on the internet. And this is something, too, that intelligence officials and military commanders are very worried about, that we've seen Chinese active mapping of infrastructure systems in the United States. So sort of looking at where are the pressure points in our own physical infrastructure and in those supply chains just within the United States and mapping that out. Uh, and the belief there would be that in the event of an actual war with China, um, we would both start attacking each other's critical infrastructure systems through cyber attacks. Uh, and there's a lot of concern about whether or not the United States is prepared for that because most of the networks in this country are privately owned. The government does not actually uh, uh, sit on them, uh, despite what we might think from what we see in movies that came out this week. Um, <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> there is a great interdependence between our government and our industry in trying to secure those systems and those supply chains, which from a cyber perspective only makes this task more complicated. Um, and just as a last thought, I know we'll get to this into the later in discussion, but to the, to the point of uh, the main question of the panel about what happens with escalating military tensions uh, in the South China Seas, um, I would say that the, the risk of cyber becoming a primary means of conflict in such a situation is very, very high. That as you see these kinds of uh, potential naval confrontations, there's a great incentive for both sides to start using cyberspace to start poking at each other and doing things full uh, uh, short of a, a full-on um, hot war. Uh, we know that, the Chinese know that. The problem is that we don't really have any understanding with the Chinese military of what constitutes a mild escalation in cyber activities and what constitutes something that looks like they are about to go full on with kinetic force as well. And that's a, a, a huge problem for trying to avert uh, something uh, very ugly going on uh, in that part of the world. Thank you, that was very uplifting. Um. <laughs> I'm a journalist, I'm here only to bring <laughs> optimism. All right, so a, a first question I want to oppose uh, uh, is right to you, Chris, um, which is, so, so 
Barry's laid out this vision, and you yourself have um, d described the same kinds of concentrations in supply chain fragility in different terms. And then Shane's talked about cyberspace, cyber rivalry, um, and you know, a question that I would pose to him that he can either say he'll answer later or not or shake his head is, are we already in a conflict with, yeah, okay. Um, so is the private sector worried about all of this? And, and the intellectual property theft, um, it doesn't seem to have slowed down the cultivation of China. Um, and, and also, you know, is China necessarily doing anything wrong in defending its interests and promoting its own economic interests this way? Is the private sector worried about these things? And if not, why not? And are they taking steps to improve the resilience of the supply chains and their own intellectual property rights? Okay, so that, that's a terrific question. Um, so let's do a definition here. Let's distinguish. We call this glob of things the private sector. It's actually <laughs> individual companies, each in its own sector, making individual decisions for their own individual good. Okay, it's not a sector. So, IP, intellectual property, yes, Every company is concerned about intellectual property being stolen. There's, you know, this narrative, this rule of thumb that if you go to China, be prepared to get it stolen or take some steps against it. Okay, that's one. But the second piece of it, which everybody seems to be glossing over, is that many companies willingly give their intellectual property to China. They want the access to the huge potential Chinese market. They want not to be harassed. They don't want litigation. They want cheap labor. They want cheap engineering resources. So they give their intellectual property, not the private sector, but the individual companies. Those that don't or do something, sometimes bad things happen to them. Uh, you know, Google gets banned, but you know, different things. So, yes, that is, intellectual property is absolutely an issue. The whole cyber issue is a major issue because, uh, you know, we all talk about the physical supply chain. That's just a few things being made and put on boats and planes and shipped here, and we use it. The real key to a supply chain is the digital supply chain. Supply chain is an informational chain, which can be hacked. Operations can be disrupted, and more importantly, for companies anyway, their plans and bills of material and designs and where they're going to do things can be taken away by somebody. So I completely agree here, and I don't know if I even answered your question, but I, but I think no, I did. You, you, yeah. you did, but the one thing I would say is that fragility that you described, why aren't individual companies more worried about that? They are worried about their own fragility. But if you look at what they're worried about, when you look at risk as a key issue with individual companies, it's the risk of supply disruption. They do not want, in the just-in-time environment and with few suppliers, their supply to be disrupted. So they look at it in a completely different way. What can I do to make sure that my customer is always, always has something available? And they do things like stock inventory, maybe uh, try and get se second sources, a bunch of things. But they look at it in a different le with a different lens than a lot of people in this room look at it. All right, Barry, you laid out a really alarming vision, right? And um, you know, one question I have is, short of an actual conflict situation in the South China Sea or somewhere else, is it in? China's interest or our interest for that matter to, to use this interdependency as a weapon. And, and why would we um, when both of our economies thrive on it, right? So, uh, but then the second question I wanna ask you is, okay, it's a terrible situation. It, it's, it's an accident waiting to happen. It's a war waiting to happen. So what are we supposed to do about it? Um, you know, I was very persuaded in the first panel by Orville Schell saying we're at a precipice and this is a moment where we decide where we go. Um, so, I mean, I don't believe that we're destined to just fall off, that we have choices. So what are the choices? 
or are we just destined to fall off? So both of those, if you could elaborate a little bit. On the first issue of why would anyone disrupt these or threaten to disrupt these systems consciously, intentionally, the short answer I would put out there is Suez. In 1956, this is a story that most Americans have, well, certainly forgotten because it took, a, took place a long time ago, uh, but we also just haven't studied it in school. 1956, the government of, in, in Egypt blocked the flow of tankers and freighters through the Suez Canal. And that meant that the United Kingdom and France suddenly found themselves blocked off from their oil flows. The United States actually stepped in as an exp uh, oil exporter at the time. We sort of made good that deficit. But the British and the French said, well, we ought to do something about it. So in alliance with the Israelis, they landed a force in the Suez and they took control of the canal. Now, at this point, this is 1956, there was the, had been the Hungarian Revolution and suppression of that revolution by the Soviets. It was the early days of the sort of mutually assured, concept of mutually assured destruction. The Eisenhower administration did not want this to proceed. It thought that this conflict, so at that point, Egypt would become a client state of the Russians, of the Soviets. So the, at that point, the Eisenhower administration wanted that conflict shut down. So Eisenhower called up, President Eisenhower called up uh, London, he called up France and said, you will get your troops out of that, um, out of the Suez and, and here's, you know, if you don't do it, we're going to crash the pound tomorrow and we are going to uh, shut off that flow of oil that you need. So next day, the French and the, and the British picked up and left. And that was, you know, that, was uh, the, that was made possible by the fact that there was interdependence. I mean, the, the, the British and the French provided us with things that we don't have, that we may need. But uh, at that point, it was a, certainly an asymmetrical interdependent relationship. We had much more power over the British and the French than they did over us. Arguably today, I would argue certainly that the, in terms of things that are actually th things that we need in our world, I mean things like drugs, you know, uh, we talked about pharma a second ago, um, electronics, China sends to us things that we consume on a day by day basis and it's done on a just in time basis for the, all the reasons that Chris just explained. In exchange for that, what we send back is bits of credit, paper, money. So it's an interdependent relationship, but it's an asymmetrical interdependency. We need China more than China needs us. So what do we do? So that means that China, if there is a conflict, the question always comes down to who says uncle first. So I think there, is a, uh, there might be a temptation by the Chinese to push this to pinch off these flows or threaten to pinch off these flows to achieve some <laughs> near-term political goal that would tr you know, maybe change the balance of power in a region. So that would be a reason to do this intentionally. But there's also the chance that this might just happen by accident. People make mistakes. The Chinese can make the mi a mistake. The Taiwanese can make a mistake. The Japanese can make a mistake. The United States can make a mistake. And given the fact that in the White House and in the uh, Department of Defense, in the U.S. military system, there is hardly anyone who really understands the structure of these systems in any kind of coherent way, the chance that the United States would make a mistake and take an action that would result in the disruption, potentially catastrophic disruption of these systems, is not insignificant. So Shane, you talked about, you know, given what Barry just said, and about the asymmetrical interdependency, you talked about the, you know, the naming of the PLA folks and the threat of sanctions, and that it seemed to work. Why did it work? So there's there's two theories on this. Uh, there's the there's the theory that it worked because the Chinese uh, 
uh, were sort of unnerved by the idea that we were far enough inside their systems that we could know precisely what they were doing and that we were willing to disclose that and, and, and sort of take the potential risks of losing access to future sources by doing it. So whenever you expose a source in the intelligence community, you're always giving up potential access to how you got that information. So you have to weigh the gain and the loss. So that may have been something that shocked them. And if you put yourselves in their shoes, I mean, how would we feel if suddenly in the Chinese press, you know, five pictures of senior military cyber command officers were running? We might be kind of unnerved too. Um, and so there's a sense that, that they wanted to, that they were unnerved by that. There are some who think that they also wanted to avoid any escalation of the kinds of tit for tat that we're talking about here because of these interdependencies. There, there's a second view, and I think I would even call it the minority view within the intelligence community, that what's actually happening here, happening here in Xi Jinping's willingness to sort of meet us halfway a bit and say, okay, well, let's go, we'll take down this, ch this industrial espionage stuff. I know you guys have a lot of concerns about it. It's not so much that he's sort of bending to Obama's will or his threats, but rather what Xi Jinping wants to do is consolidate his own authority and control over the PLA, which in itself is sort of a kind of, I don't know, semi-autonomous is too strong a word to describe it, but is in some respect a kind of a, a shell organization of corporations with its own interests and very powerful people running it. I mean, she has made no secret about the fact that he is trying to consolidate a lot of authority uh, of his office over the military. Cyber activity is a big part of what the PLA is doing. So what we may be seeing here actually is not so much China bending to our will as maybe Xi Jinping has his own agenda for wanting to kind of consolidate these authorities uh, and, and put them more under his control so that he can use them when he wants to do that, rather than the PLA doing it kind of largely out of its own interests and kind of employing their various teams of hackers and freelancers that they do. Um, I think the White House would like to believe it's the former, right, that our, that our, that our threat of sanction is having some effect. Um, I don't know that we'll know that for sure for some time to come, but those are the two theories. Uh, I'd like to give the audience a chance to ask questions. If you would please introduce yourself um, and where you're from, and uh, do try to formulate a question or at least a comment that's fairly concise. So. Um, Let's take it from the top. Wait for the microphone, please, because we do have an online audience. Right. Alan Riley, Institute of Statecraft from London. Um, uh, this is largely addressed to Barry, but also a bit to Shane. Uh, I, I think there's a historical parallel with, um, uh, with what's happening now. Uh, there's a great book by Corelli Barnett with, from a British perspective, a rather sad title, The Collapse of British Power, in which um, he describes in 1914, uh, Churchill, who was then first Lord of the Admiralty, the head of the Navy, uh, expressing incredulity that various key um, elements of the war material were actually produced in Germany. And actually, he, and how hell, as first Lord of the Admiralty, did he not know this? And why did not the Royal Navy do something about it before we actually went to war? So I think there are parallels of interdependency which exist from a very long time ago. But my, my question is that given the the description of the diamond nature of the supply chains. What do we do about it? And I'm trying to think in kind of, in kind of legal terms, where we come at this. Does that mean, for example, in relation to merger review, we have to focus on issues like supply security? Do we have to look at the supply chains? And do we need to say that we need to keep, in order to maintain supply diversity and that level of supply security, supply chains must be kept to some degree separate we can't allow too much concentration. And then from a foreign investment review, those supply chains can only be uh, located in allied states which we can work with. And does that also require that the Europeans who have no proper um, uh, investment review program have to create one? And that should be an objective of the United States in order to ensure a coherent Western response. And I have one, uh, just in relation to Shane, just very briefly, is that um, you know, MI5 and GCHQ have set up the center to actually do a lot of testing of Japanese equipment to ensure there isn't, uh, sorry, Chinese equipment, to ensure there isn't any, uh, any issue. I don't know how far that's got on the US, but it's something I know the Brits have been running with. And just one other observation is, there's not just a problem in re with Chinese technology in the West, if we go outside anywhere, for example, uh, what I'm told is that in Africa, basically, it's, it's, it's a Chinese IT province. All the telecommunications is Chinese. So if you're doing anything there, 
They've got access to everything. And what do we do about that? So I'll stop there. Okay. Barry? No, I think the question of what do you do about it is pretty much the, that's the most basic question, most important question. And uh, there's really kind of two potential answers. And one is, you, you know, you raised, which is basically regulate supply chains, regulate supply, you know, ensure that we have, you know, capacity, not just the capacities, but actually the, the, you know, finished product, you know, somewhere in a warehouse. Um, and the other option is really to sort of restructure the system. And, and then the question is, how, do you, how would you do that? Now, regulation of supply, I don't see that as actually functioning, because that would require the government to ac have a real sense and, and get an honest feed from all these private corporations about what's where. And, you know, we do that in a few cases after the collapse of the flu vaccine production system in 2004. There was some stockpiling of flu vaccines, but you can only do that for a short period of time. Um, so we do that. We don't do it well. We forget about it after a year or two. Uh, you know, it's, and it's expensive. If you stockpile goods, it's very expensive. Who's going to pay for that? The other option is you actually restructure the system. And we actually, it's r important to understand that the, the revolution that I described at the beginning, the revolutionary restructuring of the system is due to fundamentally a change in how we in the United States and in the UK uh, regulate competition. Until right up through the 19, into the 1980s, we had a strong anti-monopoly policy in this country. We extended that anti-monopoly policy into trade. So we didn't allow for people to monopolize activities here at home, and we used trade power to ensure that other folks didn't monopolize things that we wanted access to. For instance, uh, uh, the Reagan administration, I don't know if Clyde's still here, but back in the mid-1980s, the Japanese made a play to monopolize control over the components of what's inside of a, a computer. And the Reagan administration, even though they were preaching free trade, they responded with tariffs, and they responded with quotas, and they responded by going to the corporations that uh, made uh, computers and say, don't buy from the Japanese. And they said, buy from all these other, and you don't have to bring it home, just buy it from someplace else. So they use trade policy as a way of distributing capacity. So what the, the fundamental answer, I think, is actually that we have to reimpose anti-monopoly principles at home and internationally. Uh, before we uh, get Shane to answer, Chris, I want to redirect slightly. If you were giving advice to a specific company about how to make their supply chain less fragile, what, you know, answering that question in terms of a specific company, what would you tell them? Um, I, it would be simple. <laughs> Diversify your supply spend. Bring Look at the true total cost of what's costing you. Look at the time value and bring part of your spend onshore or near shore so that you have more control over it and you have a diversified base of suppliers. But first, I'd just like to address an, for seven seconds what Barry said, stockpiling versus restructuring. Today, with the exception of things like oil and sulfur and stuff like that, you cannot stockpile. The product life cycle of a component is measured between months to a year. Whatever you stockpile is out of date and obsolete before you even know it. So, you know, let's just bear that in mind as you discuss this. Just discreetly go to your two questions. But the, the National Security Agency is charged just like GCHQ, you know, with the security of information and s components and systems, but for dot mill and intelligence community you know, entities. So the United States are at large? No. I mean, we don't have a program of screening that. And in terms of Chinese presence in Africa and the telecommunications spread, it's actually a question that I, I think I would love to hear the combatant commander for U.S. Africa Command take on. You know, we have AFRICOM now, which is primarily there in that area to, as a counterterrorism force, but I think you're going to start seeing its mission perhaps evolve into more of a superpowers regional kind of a security force. No easy answer to that, though. don't mind, just wait for the microphone, because as I say, we have an online audience that's tuned in. 
Thank you very much for the whole day. My name is Paula Stern. Uh, I have my consulting firm, the Stern Group Incorporated. Um, my question goes to uh, the uh, existence of foundries, semiconductor foundries, in this country versus elsewhere, and our dependence on those foundries elsewhere. Um, I I'd like you, please, Chris, to address um, uh, the advisability um, from uh, a business point of view, uh, what the economic cost might be, but also the other two speakers, uh, advisability from a foreign policy intelligence point of view of uh, having uh, more foundries, um, not just for defense purposes, but for commercial purposes invested here in the United States. I understand you talked about a supply chain that, uh, that relied very much on China, as well as Korea, et cetera. But uh, Taiwan, uh, you didn't distinguish between Taiwan and China on that. So that's a little kind of a footnote, but I'd like to see the distinction there and whether it's a distinction that really matters um, in terms of, if you will, foreign policy. Um, my experience at the U.S. International Trade Commission, where I'm an expert witness on a lot of these 337 intellectual property rights cases that deal with um, uh, chips, uh, semiconductors, uh, really takes me very much back to this uh, vulnerability that the United States does have. And, and I'd like you to uh, tell us how you think we should be mitigating it now. Much of what we talked about was cybersecurity uh, and cyber defense, but I'd like to see some offense uh, thinking here. Thank you. You asked me, so from a purely business point of view, there are two issues. The foundry is the key to pretty much everything that goes on today. It's where the chips are, a lot of them are designed, built, photo etched, tested, assembled, and sent. So there is no argument as to that some should be here. The real reason that companies move off, have moved off, is taxes. Uh, laws, regulations, which are much l more lax there, and the tax and tax holidays, and labor costs. Um, there is no such thing as we need to make it somewhere because of the transportation costs. These things are small, and they're flown on airplanes, wherever you go to. So it comes down to all a question of money and whether other countries are pressuring these people to locate foundries there. It's, it's that simple. Regarding Taiwan, from my own very myopic point of view in industry, I look at risk, and to me, Taiwan is no risk. So I lump it with everything else. Sorry. So I lump it with everything else. Sorry. Please. Chris just brought up an issue of um, you know pressures to locate, and you know just to even you know go back to the story with which I opened about the earthquake in Taiwan and the effects that that had, you know, we can learn a lot from why those foundries that were making all of those programmable chips were all in Sinju. And that goes back to, it was basically a monopoly play by a guy named Morris Chang who was actually had bo been born in the mainland. He went to the United States. He worked uh, around the United States, worked for Texas Instruments for a long time. And then he went back to Taiwan. Uh, he was in Taiwan, and the Taiwanese government said, how can we help you help us become a bigger player in semiconductors? And he, he came up with a monopoly play, which was, I'm going to take a bunch of government money, and I'm going to invest all that government money in making the biggest foundry in the world. And then I'm just going to dump foundry services onto, you know, basically wafer making onto the marketplace. And that play resulted in the discombobulation, the breaking apart of many of the vertically integrated companies, you know, Motorola and Fairchild. And it resulted in this concentration of certain kinds of activities, uh, a, a total restructuring of, of that whole system. But it say in the 1980s, the Reagan administration clearly, based on their reactions to what the Japanese did, would have responded by saying, putting up tariffs and quotas. We're not going to allow the Taiwanese to monopolize this. 
in the 1990s when Morris Chang was doing this in Taiwan, there was no response. We had put down our arms in the meanwhile, our trade arms. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, just, just a quick thought. I mean, I think if you had, you know, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs here, for instance, or, you know, the Secretary of the Army, let's say, you'd probably get an emphatic agreement with your statement that, yeah, we should have more foundries here. It would create tremendous security for all of the weapon systems that rely on these components. And I think the military is keenly aware that, uh, of, the, of the, the fragility of the systems that we're talking about here. And I'm just briefly reminded of something that I heard David Petraeus say about a year ago where he talked about the role of the modern American military as largely being about securing free trade in the world. And he kind of, he has a riff that he goes on about this and sort of energy flows and this kind of thing. But I think that military, uh, the military leadership is just is keenly aware of these interdependencies, um, but they don't make trade policy, right? So. All right, um, okay. I have Jonathan Ziegler here. Um, I've heard the term of um, African um, development in terms of Chinese uh, growth policy being a relevant factor in this kind of dialogue. And I was curious, in terms of uh, finding, I think, a balance of, of power that between the U.S. and China, uh, would you say that Africans' uh, resources and perhaps their engagement from China in terms of access to raw minerals or, as I said, basic technologies in agriculture plays a role in terms of Chinese reliance on American goods or in long-term growth projections for what we really might be able to provide for China in terms of just raw necessary resources for further growth? You know, it's, um, uh, I think it's a really important point and, and China has uh, been, ha had a very active presence in Africa for some time with a number of countries and you know, when I talked in the beginning about the concentration of minerals, there are a number of countries on the continent that have great mineral wealth and particularly germane for high-tech applications. Um, and China is making a lot of bilateral agreements there um, that I think are, are perfectly fine as long as you have a functioning open market. But if you don't, then it becomes problematic. But it, and I want to turn that to you, uh, Barry, on one level, which is, you know, you're talking about um, the monopolistic nature of this being a problem. But when the Chinese, when a, a white paper leaked that the Chinese were going to restrict exports of rare earths, there was a market correction and a market reaction. And then the price of rare earths dropped, and they're, they're very low right now, right? Um, and there was more available in the market, because they're not actually rare. There's, they're being produced in a lot of places in Africa. They can be produced here in Australia. Um, so uh, are we necessarily wrong to rely on, the, on open markets to, to be the correction that we're looking for? And it, please also, if you, if you want to comment on the Chinese relationship with many African countries and the mercantile nature of it that I've heard you talk about before, that would be helpful as well. No, that, I mean, this is a really important point, which is industry, both you know, the minerals industry and also you know, uh, uh, the companies that procure rare earth metals. After China cut off the supply of rare earth metals, and this was actually done a few years back, and the reason was it was a, a show of strategic, uh, strategic use of, of, s of uh, the ability to cut off supply. What was happening was at that point, was there was a spat in the East China Sea between the Chinese and the Japanese. So during that spat, the Chinese just cut off the flow of rare earth metals. Now one of the main so uh, uh, buyers of rare earth metals were, is the Japanese because they have such advanced uh, materials manufacturing. So this was a, 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 a an act that was aimed very much at Japan right in the middle of a, a, of a, of a period of crisis, of, 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 of conflict. Uh, and it was designed to, you know, see what the reaction would be. Um, it, it, it had some effects. I mean, I had a lot of Japanese people, you know, uh, people in industry that I speak with, and it really did af maybe affect some of the Japanese actions at that point. But then also over time there was this uh, reaction, this sort of balancing out, bringing on new sources of supply uh, for these, um, the, these, these metals. The question is really just, you know, um, the the timeline for any kind of conflict. You know, if 
over the course of years, you are, you know, people do have the capacity to respond. But at the moment of conflict, if a conflict is playing out over the course of a month or a week or a couple of days, you do not have the ability to respond. The sources of supply can be shut off suddenly, and that the, both the reality of that shut off is going to have effects, and it's also the perception of that shut off is going to have effects, the psychological effects of things being shut down. So we cannot simply w sit here and wait for, you know, assume that if there is a crisis, everything will rebalance. I mean, foundries, a new foundry, Clyde mentioned this before, a new foundry, it costs $8 billion to stand up now. And it's going to take you about three to four years to build that. And that's with a healthy supply system. If you lose access to foundries now, if something happens to the foundries, um, there is no fixing that. We have time for at least one more question. I can give Jen in the back and then this gentleman here. Uh, Jennifer Harris, Council for Relations. Um, Sharon, I'd like to come back to the question that you opened with. Uh, so why aren't we seeing companies more concerned about uh, the sort of expropriation in the cyber domain? Uh, and I actually think it's worse than that. Uh, from my observation, I see companies actively working against some of the only recourse that uh, the U.S. government could offer. Namely, the, the SEC has been doing quiet spade work, yeoman's work really, in beginning to introduce uh, cyber protections into the idea of you know, a fiduciary duty, a, a, a duty that publicly traded companies owe their shareholders. Uh, but I'm struck by the steady creep that seems to be the work of impact litigation going on in ostensibly unconnected unco realms around a, a very expansive reading of uh, corporate speech. And uh, there's a case that will probably make its way up to the Supreme Court soon, if it hasn't already, around uh, conflict minerals and the, the way that we've slipped that into Dodd-Frank and pushing the, the corporate sort of sector pushing back on that as compelled speech. Uh, likewise, there's a case in, in Berkeley about uh, cell phone radiation and uh, sort of compelled warning labels on that um, being challenged under a, what would be an expansive step forward for the idea of corporate speech. Uh, and so I, I, I I'm watching these two trains sort of colliding and wondering whether uh, there's any one home really within uh, this fictional private sector, Chris, that you mentioned is not really a sector, uh, and, and whether uh, anyone can offer up any reason for hope or any sort of green shoots where we see companies actually uh, doing things that are net constructive uh, on, on terms of um, c cyber protections beyond waiting till the last minute to then come to the U.S. government and ask them to do something after uh, most of the crown jewels of the company have already been lifted. Let's think about that, hold it for a second, and let's get the one last question and, and go around and um, have an answer to both. Dana Marshall with Transnational Strategy Group. I think one of the really interesting parts of this whole session is what Barry has brought a new way to, a new concern that many of us have regarding supply chains. For many of us in this room that have worked in the, uh, towards reforming our international economic policies for many years, our focus in this area has not been so much security, although that's critically important and you're bringing that out, but it's more the economic impact, the jobs impact, the fact that we've seen these supply chains move enormously to countries that have not had much of a background or uh, history of manufacturing. I wonder if we might be able to join those two streams together uh, in one question which is sort of the economic side of it and the value that uh, it would have to bring these supply chains back to the United States and the security value of bringing them back to the United States. Are there some ways that we can try to build on a synergy there? From the, uh, the specific question maybe for Christopher, we've talked a lot about different ways to do it, w you know, appealing to the company's own self-interest. There's the very idea, if I have it right, of building up our antitrust laws to compel them to do it. What about the economics uh, of it at the enterprise level to encourage these supply chains to return? I, let's, uh, uh, Shane, just let me put you on the spot about the question about um, are, are private companies not acting in their own best interest and are they sabotaging in a way? Yeah, that, that's it, you raised this, this great point about um, <coughs> whether um, – 
companies should be held accountable for their cybersecurity sort of in a fiduciary way. So in other words, you know, there'll be penalties for you if you don't, if you're a bank, uh, implement certain kinds of standards. Th this has been something that's been building, I think, the pressure towards that for a long time. And frequently when I talk to officials, particularly in the Homeland Security area where they're, they're the kind of interface at DHS with private sector, you know, they, they talk about, you know, who's liable for this and can you, you know, do you need to put some pressure points in there so that the next time uh, that uh, a major retailer is hacked, uh, uh, there's going to be some penalty for them beyond just the cost of having to replace everyone's debit card uh, or something. And could you actually hold them in a fiduciary way responsible for that? That's a very interesting idea. And I think the fact that it's building reflects that there has been this either reluctance on the part of the private sector to take this seriously because perhaps they just didn't take it seriously or they see it uh, as the cost of doing business. I mean, Chris alluded to the fact that when you're in China, you just sort of assume this is going to happen to you or frankly, just a basic level of ignorance. I mean, we're living in an era, you know, now post Sony and Home Depot and Target and Anthem and some of these big hacks, but it was really only until recently that I think that even the CEOs of large companies really started to appreciate how vulnerable they really were. And the statistic that I think underscores that is that on average, according to most experts, it's about 18 months before a company really even realizes that it's been hacked. And in many of the cases, the more prominent ones that have come into public view that the FBI has investigated, it was the FBI that discovered that many of those companies were hacked. They didn't even know. Um, so, you know, even though we're living in a moment where everybody kind of now seems to be waking up to this and, you know, Mr. Robot is the hottest show on TV, mm -hmm. um, I think there's just been a really steep learning curve for a lot of these companies, too. So it's another precipice, yeah? Uh, maybe. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, like I'm sure companies don't want to be more, any more regulated than they are, so I'm sure they feel on the regulatory precipice <laughs> in that respect. But, I mean, but something has to be done from the government's perspective and, and in terms of broad national cybersecurity. And the way you do that is by forcing companies to better protect networks. I mean, the government cannot do this on its own. It's just the problem is too big. Chris, I'll, uh, I'll give Barry the last word, but I'd like to, addressing Dana's question, let me add one little uh, fill it onto that, which is, so Tesla has announced that they're going to build their own lithium mine in the United States um, and maybe in Mexico, and they're also going to build their own battery factory as well as their own finished product. Is that, is that a reasonable strategy? Oh, but Tesla it is. Is it going to work? Oh, with Elon Musk, I assume it will work. <laughs> but there's one thing I'd just like to mention about the, the regulation that you've brought up. Um, cyber security has to be regulated. In industry, we don't do anything unless we know there's an ROI attached to it or somebody's telling us to do it. Take conflict minerals for example. Why would we have, until Dodd-Frank 1502 came out and we're supposed to report on this stuff, why do it? So there's just something to think about. But coming back to the question about reshoring and the economics, I think there are a lot of economics. If you look at the economics of the time value of product, of product to customers, the returns policy, there are a lot of economic aspects to reshoring. The big one, though, is not, which is the skill sets that have been lost because the corporations have been hollowed out. You look at how many American students are taking engineering and computer science and all this at the universities, you'd sort of be shocked at what it is. It's the skill sets that need to be developed and there's individuals cannot do that. Companies won't do that. It has to be a government thing. Just a thought. Barry, last word? Yes, what Jen Harris brought up before about why are the companies not responding? You know, I mean, I think Chris just touched on this, but there's another factor, and it's, you guys have probably, many of you heard about the sort of the problem of the commons, and it's, you know, it's the basic idea is that, you know, people, when you have a, a property that people hold in, in common, often we don't do a very good job of keeping that property, you know, up to, you know, keeping, taking care of it. And what we have seen, just one way to understand what has taken place with this revolutionary restructuring of industry is that, you know, 
as all of these, you know, we, we, at certain points, we'll look around, we see a whole bunch of competition. We see different companies selling computers. We'll see different companies selling cars. But then as we've talked about, all of these, you know, for certain sizes of supplies, there's only one source of supply. One company that makes a certain kind of component for all the car companies. One company makes a certain kind of component for all of the computer companies. Now, from the point of view of s an executive in one of those assembly companies, if you lose access to that company that's way down at the bottom that makes components for everybody, there's no competitive risk there. If it goes down, if that company goes down, your company goes down, but so do all your rivals. Everyone goes down. So with the little bit of money and a little bit of resources that you have that you use to mitigate risk, all your risk is competitive risk. There's no competitive risk there. So that risk is on society. That risk has been socialized. When you allow for monopolization, then you end up with your risk being socialized. So this risk is on us. The only people going to fix this is us operating through the government. It will not be fixed by the private sector. It will not be fixed by independent companies acting alone. Okay. So um, I just want to make a closing comment that Barry and I are working with some colleagues at ASU to try to call the data on this to get a better feel for what this really looks like by the numbers. So we hopefully we'll be publishing results from that sometime in the coming year. Um, and with that, I would love to give a hand to this great panel. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now I invite you all to help yourself to some lunch. Take a couple minutes, and then we'll reconvene here to talk about Hollywood and China, an interesting topic. So please, please get some lunch. <laughs>